Chapter 11. The reason Father was so amiable with the British soldiers who walked our streets was because, in his words, we mustn't let it get like last time. He meant the last time British troops were in Boston in 1770. That time, trouble between them and the colonists had led to what Father and the other Whigs now called the Boston Massacre. Every year, on the 5th of March, they kept the anniversary of that massacre. Once again, this year, they were holding that celebration in Old South Meeting. John Hancock had been the speaker last year. This year, it was Dr. Warren, and the elder members of my family were all going. I was not. I sat watching Debbie set up a new mob cap on her head, primping in front of the one mirror in our room, pinching her cheeks for color, pulling down her stays to display just the right amount of bosom. Amos was fetching her and escorting her to the affair. You don't have to stay home and watch the little ones, you know. Rachel said she'd take them along. They go to church of a Sunday. This is no different. I don't mind. She cast me a sidelong glance. The cap was off again and she ran a hand through her shining dark curls. Don't you think I look better without it? Yes, but you know it isn't seemly to go without one. She sighed. You fought with him, didn't you? Who? Don't pretend with me. Dr. Warren, you haven't spoken to him in weeks. You're giving him an uneven time of it. Everyone notices. It's my affair if I did. You were outright rude to him when he was here last Sunday. Last Sunday, all he and father did was talk of how he knocked that British sentry down with his fist right out on the street. He is brave, isn't he? Stupid is more the word for it. Well, the sentry did challenge him, and all he was doing was coming home from visiting a patient. Since when are you taking up for him? I thought you hated him. All you've done is spirit me up to think he's carrying on with Rachel. She turned from the mirror to look at me. I only voiced my fears. You shouldn't let people tell you what to think. I did it to show you he's just a man with weaknesses like any other. You were so smitten with him. I'm not smitten with him, Debbie. I'd like to know what you call it then. I always held him in highest, in great esteem. After all, he did save us all from smallpox. She went back to the mirror and fluffed the ruffle and the chemist out of, from under the strays of her neckline. He didn't save me, she said. I stared at her. You're alive, aren't you? Sometimes I wish I weren't. Debbie, what a thing to say. Why, it's a sin against everything we've been taught. Her beautiful blue eyes filled with tears. She turned to me. Look at me. What do you see? You're beautiful, Debbie. Everyone says so. You're the prettier one, and you always have been. Look again. You mean the scars? Yes. How do you think I feel every time I look into a mirror? People don't pay mind to them, I said. Not when they really know you. I do. Not a day in my life goes by that I don't pay mind to them. You blame Dr. Warren for them? Why do you think you don't have any scars? Grandmother says I had a favorably light dose. Grandmother lies. He inoculated you. You had a light dose because of the inoculation. You and Paul, he didn't inoculate me. Why? Because I came down with it first. I had it already. So then why should you blame Dr. Warren? I don't blame him, but he's not God. Not like you think. She picked up her cap and shawl and made ready to leave the room. You tricked me, I said. How so? You pushed me into thinking he was carrying on with Rachel so I would turn against him. You tricked yourself, Sarah. You think you're so grown up. You have no idea of what it means. Take some advice from me, little sister. Know what you're about, like I do. I know I'm no beauty, but at least I'm not languishing over someone old enough to be my father. And don't let anyone influence what you think. That's what being a grown-up is all about, after all. Then she went out the door. I sat on the bed, hearing her footsteps pattering downstairs. She was right. I wasn't grown up. And because I'd tried to act like it, I'd ruined everything. I'd heard Dr. Warren, a good and true friend. I'd see the pain in his eyes last Sunday when I would not respond to his greeting. I would make it right, I decided. I would say something to him. But what? And how could I ever make it right again? No matter what I said, things would never be the same with us. There was not only pain in his eyes when he looked at me, there was disappointment. I'd seen that too. No, I decided I would wait it out. I would wait until the proper moment. And then I would prove to him that I was not the silly child he thought me to be. So I stayed home and watched the little children and baby Joshua all day. Dr. Warren gave a stirring orientation and I missed it. He took a chance even going. So did father, Sam Adams, John Hancock, and all the others. There was gossip on the streets that General Gage was going to allow them to hold the celebration and then arrest his enemies on the spot. There were no arrests, though. At least 40 British officers showed up and Sam Adams gave them the best seats. No arrests. 
but there was a near riot. Debbie told me about it that night as we lay in our beds. Warren gave a wonderful speech. Some British officers sat on the steps leading to the pulpit. If Warren had said one word too many against the king, they were ready to arrest him. Then Sam Adams suggested plans be made for next year's celebration of the bloody massacre. Some British officers yelled, fie, fie. People thought it was fire and there was a great rush to get out. Oh, you should have been there. I'm glad I wasn't. Debbie lost her new mob cap and her shawl. She was upset over that. She loved her finery and had quite a bit of it. Grandmother was always making or purchasing it for her. Always I'd been jealous because I had to wear her hand-me-downs. After what she told me this morning, though, I knew I would never be jealous of her again. Still, I had all I could to keep from saying, it serves you right.